So to say welcome to this event, uh, I'm the research officer for the Staff Pride Network at Edinburgh University. Um, and each month or so we host a research seminar and these are to promote the work of LGBTQ plus people who are doing research and the work of people who are doing research within LGBTQ plus topics. Um, and before we start, uh, I think Jonathan's going to introduce the Staff Pride Network. Thanks, Rowan. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm uh, Jonathan. Uh, pronouns are he, him. Uh, I'm one of the co-chairs of the Staff Pride Network for LGBT plus colleagues and allies. Uh, we are the network at the university, uh, which uh, works with uh, with the university and with uh, staff and PhD students and with uh, students in the wider community uh, to try and uh, well do lots of things uh, but to make the place a better place for LGBT plus people. Um, I am really excited to uh, have Sabine. Uh, Sabine who uh, has been doing a lot of uh, fantastic research in the school I work in um, and uh, Rowan uh, has been putting so much effort into arranging lots and lots of incredible research seminars. Uh, so uh, I hope you enjoy this this evening. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of shout out for uh, to Robbie behind the scenes. Uh, so if you've got any questions, uh, pop them in the Q and A. Uh, and uh, it might be Robbie who's uh, monitoring, or you might see Robbie's messages uh, in the chat box. But uh, thanks for coming along. I'll pass you back to Rowan and Sabine. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, so if, um, what we'll do is Sabine will give um, a presentation about career in AI, and then we'll have time for questions as well. So if you've got any questions as we go along, you can just put them in the chat, or you can wait to the end, um, whatever is best for you. Um, so I'll just pass over to you, Sabine. Hopefully you yeah. can share your screen. Thank you. Um, I'll just put on my screen. Sure. Okay. I hope you can all see it. Yeah, that's great. Good. Hello, everybody. Uh, as I've been already introduced, uh, I'm Sabine. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a PhD student at the Faculty of Informatics, and I've done AI research. And today, um, I want to talk to you about queer and AI, which is a um, organization that represents queer people in the fields of artificial intelligence, both in academia and in industry. And I realized that probably not everybody in here will have a computer science or AI background, which I think is not even that important because I think the projects that I want to talk about are generally an example of like how you can work towards queer representation in whatever your field of research or work is and um, how you can find out what your community needs and how you can address these needs as um, just people getting together and trying to, to change the, the system you're in. So Queer and AI is a volunteer-run organization um, that is part of a larger queer STEM network uh, and a nonprofit. It started at a conference in 2007 with just a loosely organized meetup through the conference app. And a conference meetup is also how I came to Queer and AI. I attended a natural language processing conference in 2019, and I just saw in the conference program that there is a social for queer people. And so I went and I was really um, impressed with the organization and the work that they do. Um, so that's what got me started in like volunteering with them. And I think as queer and AI, we care a lot about what the members or what queer people in our community face in terms of problems. This is the reason why every year we run an annual survey on, and I'll show some examples from the survey that we did in 2019. Um, one of our findings was that most of the senior folks, so people who are faculty or professors or have higher up industry positions, are not out in the workplace, even though more people are coming out than in the previous years. We also found that most people in our queer AI community are fairly young, that they are in their bachelors or masters or early career researchers. We've also found out that 
these people don't feel welcome in conferences and feel a lack of queer community and queer role models. Especially queer scientists experience harassments in the workplace and at conferences. 60% have been target of derogatory comments, 50% have been targets for innuendo or joke, 40% have been bullied or intimidated or others, and even 20% have feared for their physical safety in the workplace or in work contexts. And queer and AI is really up to change this. And today in this talk, I wanna talk about three of the many projects that Queer and AI has ongoing. Two of them I will cover a bit shortly. And then on the third one, I will talk a bit longer because that's something that I have been very involved with. And that's kind of close to my heart because of this. So first on Queer and AI has uh, a support for grad school application programs. It um, breaks down in two things. First, financial support for GRE or TEFL in grad school applications, so language exams and sometimes application fees that some universities have. Um, for example, when I started my PhD at the University of Edinburgh, I had to take um, a language test, like a TEFL, I think that was 300, 300 euros, which is quite a big financial barrier for people. And um, the financial support that Korean AI can offer helps to alleviate that barrier. Um, the second thing that we do is review of application materials by queer researchers that either because they are role as faculty or because they are um, reviewers in other contexts like, um, for example, scientific publications, um, they can review application materials of people who wanna apply to grad school somewhere. And this again is, a way for us addressing the problem that queer people often lack the community um, where they can like exchange these things and in like just you know when you have friends who go what go to grad school or went to grad school or if you have family members. Um, these programs are open to queer applicants from all STEM disciplines, not only computer science or like stereotypically AI fields. And we are also always uh, welcoming new reviewers if you want to support us by um, reading application materials. Feel free to reach out to me afterwards. Another program that we launch to support people um, to build community within AI and to alleviate the problem of like feeling unwelcome at conferences is our undergrad mentoring and conference body program. The undergrad mentoring started at a conference this year, like a few months ago, and is currently ongoing. It's a monthly mentorship series where mentees meet with their mentors. And we also have um, something like a open mailing list where we broadcast conference calls for conference that have undergrad tracks so that people can early on in their scientific career get involved with conferences and therefore like also better their chances for grad school applications and so on. Um, at the moment, for example, um, in a few days on October 10th, there will be an open, open question and answer session where um, people from academia and um, people who are in grad school currently or have finished grad school answer questions um, about is grad school for you? What is to expect? How to go about that? How to find good supervisors or mentors? And um, the conference body scheme is along the same lines. Um, we set it up so people feel less alienated and less insecure at conferences, both, both virtual and in person. And it works like uh, this, that you can, if you sign up to the conference, you will get asked the questions if you wanna be teamed up with a conference body. And that way we connect queer people, especially who haven't been to a conference and who don't really know how to navigate these spaces to um, have somebody to talk with beforehand and then maybe meet up in the course of the conference and um, yeah, also build some confidence uh, around the whole experience. The third project that I want to talk about um, is the one that kind of got very dear to me in the last months, that is the Inclusive Conference Guide. Earlier this year, I served as a, a member on the Diversity and Inclusion Committee of one of the largest natural language processing conferences that there are in my field. 
And um, that and other things <laughs> prompted me and other people in Queer and AI to start this inclusive conference guide where we put together best practices or guidelines that we um, found out from our members um, and to pass them on to conference organizers to make conferences more queer friendly and accessible. And because of the global pandemic that we're in, if you attended a conference recently, it mostly looked like this picture. It was a virtual space. It was online meetings. And that's why our conference guide specifically focuses on virtual conferences. Um, first, let's go back to our study or the, the um, survey that we did. Because in the survey, we also asked people to rate on a scale of one to five, how comfortable queer people feel at conferences in general. And we got a rating of 3.45. So five, the best possible one, the, the least comfortable possible. We also asked our members, which maybe that's like a bit biased, asking them how welcome they feel at queer and AI events, but there our rating was better. So we see that there is a span between how safe and welcome people feel in events that are dedicated for queer people versus how they feel in the field in general. We also asked about satisfaction with registration forms because many conferences ask you to put in your gender when you uh, register for the conference, which is very problematic. We can see this by um, this difference in the rating that cis people were generally more satisfied with this feature than non-cis people that were actually very unsatisfied with the requirement of conference organizers asking for gender at registration. Also, people remarked that less than 20% of conferences that they attended had their um, conference attendees wear pronoun tags. So 90% of non-cis survey answers reported that they would prefer uh, indicating pronouns at registrations and not their gender. They also reported lots of cases of microaggressions related to pronouns and gender in regard of attendance to virtual conferences. Another problem that trans conference attendees come up against a lot is the name change policy on conference publications, because often uh, conferences will give out a proceedings where the research of people will be um, published and it is really difficult and full of like barriers and bureaucracy to get your name changed in these publications. Also, there is a problem that if your academic work is cited later on, this might cause dead names to appear in citations and people being outed this way. So, Building from this answer to our survey and from our own experiences as members of diversity and inclusion teams at conferences, um, we came up with a guideline how conference organizers could best elicit the information that they need while still being queer friendly and as accessible as possible. We um, recommend in our guide that asking for gender identity is needlessly invasive and risks misrepresenting members of the queer community. Neither participants of the conference should benefits, benefit from knowing um, the gender of individual participants. So like there shouldn't be gender specific target advertising, for example, or so there is not really a need for, for these, this information to be in the hands of the organizers to begin with. Instead, we recommend to um, give people the opportunity to indicate their pronouns with registration. Because if your conference is held in an English speaking country, uh, the English language has this feature of gendered pronouns. And when we talk in English to each other, we tend to address a person by their name, but also by their pronoun. So this way, pronouns are actually really important for facilitating a conversation between conference attendees, especially in a virtual context um, where gender information is not really. 
So we put up this example form as um, best practices that we want to give conference organizers um, when they collect data. It is important to make sure that multiple choices are allowed so that like you don't have to pick between one pronoun. Um, that conference organizers makes, make clear what the pronoun data is used for. So for example, in this, in our example, we, we state that this data is collected for statistical person, purposes and kept confidentially and will disassociate from personal information. And then there will be an additional question that says, okay, for the use of conference badges, for example, or chat rooms in the conference, what pronouns should be displayed? This way, um, people don't necessarily have to misgender themselves, but also can navigate the sometimes difficult um, terrain of like being out to their colleagues or being out in a in a sign like in a context of their work environment. So here we give people the opportunities to say, "Hey, um, please use the same pronouns that I gave you. Don't use any pronouns or add di as use different pronouns in like my." public facing representation. And with the pronouns, again, we also have the option to say, please don't use any pronouns um, with me, just address me by my name. Um, I would not like to disclose this information or like a field where, field where you can like specify your own pronouns if the drop down menu of these will not help you. Some conferences have um, have the desire to track the gender of their participants specifically to track how well they do in terms of diversity and to keep up like statistics saying, okay, we did these measures and it actually increased the participation of women, for example. In these cases, although we discourage to ask for gender in generally, we recommend that um, gender statistics are collected separately from the registration so that you can register without being even asked for your gender, but that if conference um, organizers really want to collect this data that they will be um, asked after the fact or like that that you after you registered you will get a survey. So again, it is important that conference organizers make clear what their aims are and how data is stored and used. So for example, we recommend as best practices to say, okay, are you co collecting it as statistics? Like what, what is your goal in general? And then um, who has access to the information? How is gonna be kept? It, will it be dissociated from other personal information? So those are really important um, informations that participants needs to know. Then there are multiple options and those options should not be exclusive. So you could, for example, take non-binary woman. So again, um, we agreed to use woman and man as opposed to male and female, and also decouple the categories of non-binary and gender fluid, gender non-conformant. Again, there is always the option to say that you don't wanna give any information or specify your own. One thing that we realize, and that's like the caveat we also put in, that these kind of gender denominators are very centered on the English language and are very Western centric. We know that um, different language communities and different parts of the world will have very different views on that. And um, that is something that comes as a big caveat to just assume that um, because a conference organizer is in the UK or in the US, that these gender categories will be actually applicable for everybody who comes in with the conference. So that is another thing that organizers should keep in mind if they want to collect these information. Apart from like this very specific part that is, um, it was kind of a sore point because in our Queer and AI Slack channel, we had lots of instances of people like sending us screenshots with um, when they wanted to register in a conference and there was like this drop down menu where they had to put their gender, it could either be male or female and that's it. And 
these these kind of templates that we give them give future conference organizers hopefully will lead to a better approach where it is just down to okay how do i implement this specific form but um the inclusive conference guide also includes many other points it is um you can find it on the queer and web page where it is kind of a live and ongoing document but we will also present this as a paper in a workshop in a conference uh, in a few months where it, it will be part of the widening nlp workshop so a workshop that is specifically targeted at the natural language processing community but Again, we also work on different iterations of this um, work to present at other conferences so as to spread it throughout the whole AI community. So other parts of the guide include that conferences should have a code of conduct that out lays out the expected behavior and also outlines not uh, behavior that is not tolerated, for example, instances of misgendering, of harassment, and so on, with clear examples. And that in the code of conduct, it should be made very clear how to um, report breaches of the code of conduct. We strongly recommend that there is a um, professional conduct committee on duty throughout the whole conference. So like just an awareness group that you can reach out to via many channels like chat or email or other like conference internal platforms. And that this team um, continues to be available after the conference ends because sometimes it takes some time to process out and to realize that, oh, wait, what that happened was like actually homophobia or it was discriminatory or it was harassment. Another point that is really important in virtual conferences is the safety of chat rooms and virtual social events. Many conference platforms have an interface that is similar to Slack or Rocket Chat or other like chat platforms you might be familiar with, where you can like create dedicated chat rooms and it is a great opportunity to foster queer community by having a dedicated queer chat room where queer researchers can network can like talk about shared projects and so on but the problem with that is that the attendance lists of these chat rooms should be kept confidential and that it is actually dangerous to out a person that way and so conference organizers should make sure that this is maintained. Also, those chat rooms often have block lists for certain words that are considered slurs or sexual terms, which often include terms like queer or lesbian or gay. And it's important that organizers or chat room administrators check these block lists beforehand so that a person just labeling themselves as a lesbian or as queer will not get them banned from the platform. Like another point, and I think like I just have like this, this dot list here. So you can you can already guess that I will talk next about speaker and participant diversity. But that's another really sore point with conferences, because with conferences moving online, um, lots of barriers have been torn down in terms of visa, in terms of travel cost, but other um, barriers like, for example, attendance fee um, to conferences are still in place. Ways to alleviate that is, for example, to um, give out diversity and inclusion grants that will allow people of a marginalized identity to attend for free, or tiered conference pricing that um, will make it possible for people of that live or work in certain geographic region to attend the conference as a re at a reduced rate or for free. Um, when it comes to speaker diversity, there is really uh, an important path to take where it comes to tokenism and um, privilege. When selecting speakers, it's really easy to fall into this thinking of like, oh, we take the most famous person and invite them. We take the most um, person with the most awards or with the most papers and invite them. And I think there has to happen a change of thinking where people also consider the lived experience of marginalized people to be of equal value 
as the merits that people with lots of systemic privilege have. So I think speaker diversity is, is a really difficult point and it's wor worth like advertising for and to make sure that people are aware that they need to balance their panel, that they need to balance their keynote speakers with regards to uh, marginalized identities or else this is just like kind of an echo cham chamber that recreates itself. The next point um, is one that I already touched on from the survey that is camera ready and proceedings because often trans authors face a lot of adversity when they try to change their names in conference publications and uh, independently of the inclusive conference guide that is another um, big area of advocacy that queer and AI um, is doing and where being an organization with um, like many members and some kind of like Twitter fame it really helps because it helps us to reach out to publishers of journals and to organizers of conference and to exert this kind of pressure. And it actually um, has helped. Um, one thing that um, we advocate for and that is like a piece of software that's basically in the making right now is um, software that allows um, conference proceedings to be automatically checked for dead naming. So the way it works is that like when you have like some kind of publication, our code will just go through it and check if you cited somebody wrongly and that will just automate this process of like writing the publishers and saying, okay, hey, um, my name is wrong in these and these places, please change it. So this is, I think, a huge step that will take hopefully the burden from lots of trans people who had to just like pick through things like publication by publication and reach out to publishers or even worse, just like stumble upon their name being cited wrong. And last and not least, accessibility um, is another big point when it comes to making conferences as free of barriers as possible. Like there is a large overlap between the queer community and the disability community. And there is definitely no one fit all recipe to make the perfect accessible conference. But it's really important to start building conferences with accessibility in mind and not have like the mindset of like a post hoc bug fix where you think like oh this is not accessible to blind people i guess we fix like and put a patch here oh this is not accessible to deaf people so we put a patch here but like if there is a possibility to design interactions in a virtual space designing them with accessibility in mind first is is i think a crucial point here and that is like another thing that we as queer and ai want to like do more learning and working on about and extend our conference guide there. So after all of this, like um, speaking of like the, the three, some of the many projects that Queer and AI has gone on with three of the like bigger projects that I've been involved with, um, building an online community is really at the heart of Queer and AI. Like most of this organizing that I've been talking about happens over our Slack channel and we have a mailing list with over 500 members. So just like going to the web page, getting on the Slack channel and, and so on is already a good way to get involved. Even if you don't want to get involved in like any good, big project, it's a good place to just get to know people in the community. Like I, through the Slack channel, like we have this kind of program where you can like get assigned a random person and just meet up for a coffee uh, sometime and that like connected me with people all throughout the world and that also like gives one the feeling of a queer community even though you might be the only queer person in your workplace or you might be the only trans person you know in in your field like this is a great way to kind of extend this network and feel a little bit more represented and present in this world. And um, lastly, I want to point out the widening NLP big directory, which is again, quite focused on natural language processing, but it's a public directory where people from underrepresented groups 
a natural language processing can like create a little profile and conference organizers can then look if they look for speaker they can look at this directory and kind of see okay these are people that i can invite who can bring uh, a queer perspective or a trans perspective or um, a person of color perspective to my panel which is I think helpful in terms of speaker diversity and I would encourage people to like put their name on there so they can get invited if that's if that's what they want to do for their career yeah and I think with this um, I want to close and uh, yeah thank you thank you all for inviting me and I'm open to questions so much Sabine that was really interesting um and you've done, yeah, the organization has done so much. Um, so if anyone has any questions, if you could put them in the Q&A tab, um, that would be great. We'll be able to see them. And um, I guess I can start off. Uh, probably the most obvious question is what has the reception been to Queer and AI um, at conferences? Um, has it been well received? The kind of inclusive conference guides so it's it's kind of like it's a bit of a two-sided sword because i think there has been lots of positive feedback like people are really happy that things move on and that um for example there are like diversity and inclusion grants and conferences that there are like virtual socials where people can connect and so on that has been great and um i think the more difficult part comes when you're inward facing like when you talk to conference participants and like people on the outside they really welcome this work when you talk to people who are actually organizing these conferences it gets more difficult because i think within the conference organizers and publishers and so on there is a huge lack of awareness of what the problems are like one stark example that that we had like in the conference where I was in the diversity and inclusion committee is that we wanted to give out diversity and inclusion grants so people could attend for free. And um, it is a conference with several thousand attendees. And um, one of the head organizers said something along the lines, oh, last time we gave out 90 grants, that must be enough, right? And it was like 90 for a conference of several thousand people, like, that's not realistic. And if you look at the demographics of the conference, like the majority of people attending are like from wealthy nations, are from like big universities that are already really well represented. And the people who are lacking, like there were hardly people attending from Africa, hardly from South America and so on. Like there is a huge lack of awareness that this is something that needs to be changed. And um, yeah, it's like, I think that's that's I hope really that that Korean AI is there at every conference to like kind of nudge these people because it keeping up the consistency in this effort is really difficult because like you have like one conference where you have a really dedicated team of like 10 postgrad students who pour like lots of effort and time in there into this but they won't be there at the next conference and the next conference, it will be different people. And I think this inclusion guide that we put out there is like the first step to like trying to set standards, trying to set continuities to make, to set kind of precedents saying like, okay, this time we gave out 2000 uh, diversity inclusion awards for people to attend for free. Next year, it has to be more, next year it has to be more, something like this. So that that like kind of the efforts that one group of people puts in don't vanish because that has been like a huge problem that like i mean as, as i said like the reception on one hand is really positive you always have the people saying like oh wow that's great work but then when it comes down to money and resources and who gets invited as a speaker and so on you're dealing in areas of people who don't don't know that like queer people exist and people who are really like have kind of like this narrow view of of their field and that's that's all they care about so yeah it it has it has been tough and it has been really rewarding yeah it's a big task <laughs> yeah a couple of questions in the q a so one is from daniel um, and they say as a fresher is there any society or community we should be aware of in the university of edinburgh specifically 
No, maybe maybe that's more like for one for the stuff pride network, right? Like um, the uh, pride society would be like yeah, the exactly. one that I would uh, point to. Yes, um, then. Um, I don't know like if you're within informatics and are specifically in, interested in like kind of a, a queer context of, of, of machine learning AI and so on, because I think there are like coding societies, there are, I think there was like an, an ethics and AI something society as well, but um, yeah, also there is um, one group that I can recommend is also like the um the hoppers then but they are like women in in or women and non-binary people i'm not sure uh in in informatics they also put on interesting events yeah i would definitely say get involved with uh student lgbt plus society as well because there will be people in informatics there yeah yeah i i, I would expect so like this i think it's pretty big faculty so like um, next question is from Zara, and Zara says, this sounds like a fantastic organization, and you're all doing great work. Do you know of anything similar for other fields? Because um, Zara does medical research slash molecular biology, um, and they would like something like that for their conferences. I, th I think I think there is something similar in chemistry, but I'm not I'm not sure. I just remember that we once invited some somebody from chemistry to be a panelist because uh, he was really involved with like this name change in uh, publication things. So I think there might be something like that that I'm vaguely aware of. I'm actually I'm actually not sure because like AI is kind of my field and that's why I never really ventured out of that. But um, if there actually is not something like that, putting up conference socials, for example, can be quite a low level thing. So like this thing, Queer and AI got started because somebody just like posted on the conference app, hey, do you want to do a queer meetup? And then people just signed up for that. Like it takes kind of this first bit of bravery to put yourself out there and saying like, hey, I want to organize a meetup with, with this specific like target. But that might be a first step. Maybe you get to know like the other 10 people who are queer and in your field of research and at this conference. And that, that might be the start of a Slack channel and that might be the start of a meetup at the next conference and so on. So like, I mean, even starting very small can maybe snowball in something as big as this, but it, it's a first step to like just creating community. Yeah, and I think the, well, the query that I um inclusive conference guide is really transferable to any type of conference. It doesn't specifically have to be an AI conference and that could be a good place to start um, wherever, like whatever your field is. Yeah, I think, I think like another good thing for just, you know, starting something is, is that like once you have like a homepage saying queer and AI or I have a Slack channel, something out there, uh, people start asking you about things. So like one way how I kind of like this whole diversity and inclusion guide got started because some organizer from a different conference reached out to me saying like, hey, what are your recommendations? And then like I wrote an email like delineating all of these things. And then out of these emails like grew other things that eventually became a paper, became a homepage, became another paper that we're working on. So um i think just being visible somehow saying oh we are queer in biochemistry we are queer in ai we are queer in like i don't know fluid dynamics creates a point that will attract other people yeah definitely i've always found twitter is an amazing place to find people and then you can kind of create your own thing um wherever you are yeah. and continue to add questions in the in the chat if you have questions um, Sabine, I hope it's okay to ask what your experience of being queer in AI has been like. So I think in Edinburgh, it was overwhelmingly positive, I must say. So before that, um, I, I did my undergrad and master's in Berlin. And I must say there, because I was one of two women in my course of study and like I hardly ever saw the other one so like it was a really male dominated space and kind of also 
there was a lot of toxic masculinity. So I think what helped me in these years was to just like join the university queer society, but people there were not in computer science. They were doing sociology and like things that are more associated with kind of soft subjects. And um, yeah, like I think that was there was like really this disconnect for me between like my my personality as a person doing computer science and a queer person. And when I like, again, visibility, because I was like really outspoken about being involved with that society, I became kind of the person other queer people flocked to. So like I was friends with like three gay guys, basically that's like the other queer people in, in my course of studies. Like they, they somehow like just, just read my rainbow pins or my like, hey, do you want to join me at this queer event or whatnot as like, oh, okay, this is a person I can be out to. But there was like really like this fear of okay if like other people in the course clock me as queer that will be bad for my reputation somehow and like yeah I think in Edinburgh it was really different because um in the PhD I just happened to know so many other queer people who also were doing their PhD so I think Staff Pride Network helped a lot there because it was just yeah let's go have free cake <laughs> me and like the other five queer people I know so um, that that was that was again like I think it, it's really different because I think the the gender balance in, in the grad school program in like natural language processing is, is a bit better because lots of people from linguistics come in like it's not super just informatics heavy so to say and um yeah that that made it easier so i think like just the increase of diversity between like edinburgh and berlin was was like kind of like liberating and made it nicer for me here it's really good to know um yeah, you can imagine it's quite isolating otherwise if it's if it feels like it's just you and this one other person um, <laughs> that you don't see very often. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was gonna ask kind of um, oh there was like a question right. from Stefano. Uh, what do you think is at the root of the recruitment imbalance? So yeah, I think that's that's a big question. Um, so I think I think the reason why so few women were in my bachelor's and master's course were due to like just gender cliches about computer science that are really prevalent. Like because it's Germany, I can only talk about Germany, but I think one of like the many things that I've heard or that I'm still hearing when I tell other people about like, hey, I'm doing computer science and so on. It's like, wow, that's so hard. I always hated it in school. How are you doing this? And so on. So I think there is like this really um, strong cliche of, oh, it's just something that ugly men do. And why would you, a woman associate with that? Or like, it has like this really kind of macho vibe around it, at least in Germany which I hope with like the rise of more digital technology in our life, um, this might change just because people interact with like phones and tablets and computer games all the time. So maybe girls will also at some point feel like they can um, associate with that or maybe also like just, just kind of the, the messaging that they get at schools and from their parents and from media will eventually change um, to like being more accommodating of saying like, hey, this is, it, this science is not gendered by default. It's like the people who practice it, make it into that. Um, so I think that's, that's the first step. The second step is that there is a very toxic culture of academia that is, um, not addressed as much as it should like there is um the reality of of overwork of like this this um over idealization from uh from like being just burning yourself out working all the time there is um also again kind of a really masculinist macho kind of approach to science of like publish or perish collaboration is for the weak and like you have to you have to like kind of leverage and exploit instead of like you know be a nice person and um yeah i think that's another problem that's like a cultural problem then there is like the very real problem of um academia as a workplace where you don't get 
paid as much as you would other where in other places where you get short term contracts and where you um, are expected to move around a lot. So like when I finish my PhD, if I wanted to stay in academia, which I don't, it would basically require me to hop on from one two year contract to the net next all over the world which is not really compatible with um, having a family or with even not leaving like living kind of like a precarious lifestyle if you want to like kind of have some sort of financial security which is really important for your health both mental and physical then this is really just one way to burn you out and I think people who don't already have a strong network of privilege, AKA white men, are more easy to affected by this because if you are already um, under strain because you have caring responsibility, because you experience racism, because you experience ableism, because you experience classism, it is even easier for you to like crack under the strain if you don't have like, the, the kind of support network that people with lots of systemic privilege have. So I think it's, it's like many things. I think it's like culture in our society, culture within academia, and then just like the working, um, the systems that work uh, is organized in, in, in academia. Yeah, that was a long question. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know if, if it's if it's like it might be a capitalistic approach, but I would say it's not a recent problem, but rather um, I mean academia until very recently was a very male dominated thing at all. Like it is only a few decades that like women like go to universities in large, large amounts and graduate and so on. Right. So like it's it's not only trying to, I mean, of course there's the 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 side of like, okay, as a researcher you have to produce, but there's really like a really real cultural side of like it, research is a thing that white men do. And um the perspective that we're interested in are like the perspective of great thinkers and not of people who are like collaborative or don't, don't fit the mold of like the old dude with a beard and like a lab coat. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm, yeah. Like, I'm happy to rant about this. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there anything, I guess this is a big question, is there anything that you'd like in AI to be able to do in the future? So I think what, what I'm really excited about is like we have run a few workshops where we had just like, you know, it was co-located with a conference, but the workshop was really focused on um, the contributions of queer people. So just queer people like um, presenting their research work or um, research that was like specifically targeted at like the intersection of queerness and AI. Like there have been also uh, workshops like resistance AI that specifically looked at ways that artificial intelligence can be used, for example, against surveillance, against discrimination and so on. So like AI has like this, this thing that it's um, often used by those in power to exploit people. And it, it is really interesting to examine how people resist AI and how like how, what are, strategies how we can use the tools of the oppressor to like make actual good things happen so that's um i think if for my vision it would be really like integrating those queer and ai workshops and making them like really a staple in the scientific community and to be like a really clear and present voice for queer matters and, and generally kind of anti-oppression work within the AI community. That's a big job. <laughs> yeah. Take a long time. yeah, but like, I mean, we've, we have an amazing community with really dedicated mm -hmm. people and um, yeah, like it's really, it's really many hands that make that happen. Definitely. So before we, Started recording, I guess. Um, also, talked a little bit about um, the art space. Um, do you want to explain what that is? Oh um, yeah, like <laughs> I, I don't know. Like uh, yeah, there was in the chat before we started. I think um, so. Art space was a thing that I, uh, I and a friend of mine started in informatics. Um, 
a few years ago before the pandemic hit and it was a weekly event that we just put up in like a shared space in the informatics forum where we uh, got some funding from the school to buy art supplies and we would just like you know put up art supplies and everybody could just come and join us and like make some art like we had a badge maker to make badges and just like clay to to make cool sculptures and just painting materials and so on which was pretty cool, but it was an in-person event. It was like a weekly thing where we would just actually just get together for two hours and, and sit around and talk, which was really nice. And um, when the pandemic hit, we had to close this down and um, we still had a bunch of budget left over. So we bought a vouchers from Greyfriars Art Shop. And um, at the moment, this is all kind of in, in a frozen sleeping beauty state. So all of the art supplies sit around in the forum. All our money is just hanging out and waiting for us all to come back and do it again. So um, if any of you are in informatics and want to do an art space, reach out to me because um, I'm graduating soon and uh, this will all have to be inherited and hopefully will take off again when it's like safe to meet in large groups again or large groups i mean normally we're like around 10 people but yeah i think like the, the the requirements are really that you're in informatics like either either as like staff or student um because you need to um be able to access the building but apart from that i think there are no postgrads hmm? is that undergrads and postgrads I, or, or just I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I think I think you have to be postgrad. I'm not sure about okay. if undergrads can can get into the informatics forum and has like so. I mean, but generally, I think it's it's an all informatics. So I, I have to ask. Probably it's oh like Jonathan. Yeah, Jonathan, you're more <laughs> into that. So undergrads or no undergrads? Sorry, I've never been into this building. No, no undergrads. Okay. Sorry, no, undergrads. sorry. No undergrads are allowed into the informatics forum. Okay, no undergrads. Uh, but yeah, if you're a graduate student or staff, please reach out to me. I would I would love to to give give away all of this art space stuff so you can make an art space. Well, I wish I was in informatics so I could use all your art supplies. Ah, well, uh, we are looking at some kind of staff pride network event to uh, use uh, take advantage of one of the art space pieces of equipment. Uh, well, is it the batch maker? <laughs> it is. You're very welcome to use it. The batch maker is like a very beloved uh, instrument against oppression. I love it. But yes, that's that's to come at some point when our uh, new social events officers decide that they want to uh, do that. Uh, but yeah, that's one of the great things about art space that uh, it was used to make some uh, Staff Pride Network badges with the uh, the standard logo and also with the uh, trans flag logo. Oh, so that's, I'm, I'm glad that that the art space is, is a sibling of the Staff Pride Network. So yeah, I don't know. Um, I'll, uh, I just uh, building on the uh, what you had uh, on your slide about pronouns and uh, how that was. Uh, quite um, well, well. I was trying to. I wondered uh, if you'd like to talk a bit more about that. I, we had a question from one of the uh, another department at the university uh, about pronouns, uh, wanting to promote using pronouns and having on some documentation uh, about different pronouns. Um, <laughs> And so that was making me think then how maybe um, if you had in your survey then gathered how important this was to people, to queer and AI people, um, because anyone that we're ever asking to do something, they like to see evidence of why they should do it. Oh, wow. uh, and it sounds like uh, you've asked people these questions yeah definitely like i can i can definitely try and pull that up um i mean i don't have the survey results like right here but i know who to ask to get to them and um i'll i'll do that i'll i'll get back to you and like i'll definitely send you a link to like our guide and um also we have like another link 
on there that like just has like a general what are pronouns why should we use them uh kind of explanation thing so maybe that's already helpful uh but yeah like about the survey i, I can definitely find that out for you great great certainly we're really pleased that staff and uh phd students i think it is can um put their pronouns now on their uh lots of university systems uh, and we're about is there a blog post already up about that i think there is a blog post already up about that on our staff pride network page um so uh yeah it's really cool that people can do that now yeah that's nice yeah, if there are any more questions, um, put them in the Q&A or the chat. Otherwise, we'll say thank you for being us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was absolutely delightful chatting with you. And um, yeah, hope to it's see you. It's been lovely. And it's, yeah, it's just amazing how much has come out of a group of people at a conference wanting something. And now you've got all this all this work that you've, you've all done. And it kind of shows that if you want to if you want something, you, you kind of have to have to just go for it, and and there'll be other people out there who, who want the same thing who currently haven't, haven't really got that. So it's amazing to see. Yeah, it's it's great that like this example can be encouraging. I hope mm -hmm. I hope you all go forward bravely. <laughs> Good night. Thank you so much for joining us, Sabine. Yeah. And thank you everyone else for um, coming along. Robbie has put a lot of links in the chat. Um, about our different social media, Twitter, and there's also a form to fill out to give us feedback to help us with future events to see what you liked or didn't like about this event as well. Um, yeah, you can add your thanks and messages to Sabine on the form as well. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Sabine, for, for coming along. Yeah, see you around. Bye bye.